We are moving on now to poet Tim Mason. Coming from the Cambridge area today, Timothy Mason uh, has been actively performing his poetry and doing many works for the world related to poetry as well as music and other art forms. Um, often sharing his own through poetry slams or campfires at the Kerrville Folk Festival, to name one place where he has been. He comes originally from the Midwest and his home in early days, more of the Utah area. And then in the last few decades or so, he has called uh, Worcester and Boston, uh, Cambridge, his home as well, his homes. His work in the past has included human services type of work, and such as telephone crisis intervention hotline, training as a rape crisis counselor, working with developmentally disabled adults and court-involved youth, and eight years volunteering in a battered woman's shelter. He now works in bookkeeping for making a living, but he works in the world beyond, bringing the people to the arts of poetry and folk music and more in many different ways. He is director of the New England Folk Music Archives. Over 25 years, he's been presenting folk music to New England audiences, and that includes reviving Club Passim and bringing the Poets Theater to Passim and pioneering new audiences at Capos in Lowell, Massachusetts, and bringing the old Vienna Coffee House in Westboro, Massachusetts, to national prominence. Uh, I miss it there. <laughs> and he has done all of this work in addition to his own love of performing art through poetry. Often it's in collaboration with others. For instance, he has paired poetry with the music of WPI Jazz Department, with a big band, in smaller ensembles and pops concerts, folk festivals, uh, with the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and James Hill and Ann Davidson, to name a few. He has collaborated especially with singer-songwriter, musician Jeff Bartley, and they have created two full-length CDs. His most recent work is Feral Voices, published in February 2009, in full-length 94-page collection of poetry. And it gives a non-human voice and sensibility to the 21st century experience on our shared planet. I know he's involved in a great deal more. Uh, I get that sense from looking at his website and hearing from people out in the circuit of both folk music and poetry. He uh, is also humble uh, in the work that he does, but you can ask him more during break, or you can take a look at his website. I'll end by saying this quote, his insight is genuinely hip because it is accessible and sensible and kind. And with that, I would like to invite Tim Mason up to come and share some poetry with us this morning. It's April, which means it is National Poetry Month, but in my world, at least equally as important, it's the beginning of baseball season. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with uh, a poem about my baseball card collection. I was reminded of it when I went out and spent some time with my family, and my nephew showed me his baseball card collection. He brought out binders. The mythic sporting images were not perspiring in their plastic prophylactics. No card edge was bent or chipped. No gunpowder stains are showing. They're like bugs on pins or encased in amber, perfectly preserved and perfectly dead. As he proudly points out the value of his latest page, my mind flashes back to the two battered shoe boxes now stashed in my closet, carrying the dust from many of my lives. My cards. Once complete sets, 67 and 68, all tattered and scratched, taped, marked in pen, charted the trades and transformations. Me and Danny. We played out a 187 game season with our teams. Keeping statistics, we took over my TV room, his den, masking tape bases, our trombone cases, making the walls of the house that Ruth built to home of the Braves. 
With a button ball, we would slide the pitch, roll the dice, and wear out the knees and many pants sliding our cards after them. Now, four decades later, I can still see the muscular arms of Aaron, bat on shoulders, a regular for my guys, top right edge torn from bouncing off the walls, backside stats worn smooth for speed and swiftness, a sure threat to steal a base with the right wrist action. My last card in 67 was Mantle. I had amassed doubles and triples by the score, cutting the rookie cards and taping them on to expand the roster. And then I got him. A headshot. Mickey Mantle. A face looking stupid. I had him before Danny did. Kept him for reputation, then dove into the treasure Danny's uncle bestowed. Gil Hodges, Ted Williams, Whitey Ford. I got the doubles. And going to beat that, I hit the library, tearing the pictures from the history books, wrapping my doubles with Ty Cobb, Stashel Page, Josh Gibson. We expanded to the minors, the mud hens and bees, Pioneer League specials, Boise, Spokane, the Negro Leagues, Kansas City Monarchs, Homestead Grays. We had a card for the commissioner, Ford Frick, and even umpires. And later, when we were older, cheerleaders taken from Playboy. <laughs> if we were going to explore the off-field dimensions of the game, money was beside the point. It was a way of life that we were after, and when we saw our baseball cards, they were alive. Uh. Thank you. So, I do... Uh, try to take a lot of my inspiration from things that occur around me because I find it's usually stranger and more interesting than the things that I actually make up on my own. One, uh, one that, well, that same trip I um, visited with my nephew, I got the chance to spend some time with my father and shake out the branches of the family tree a little bit. So I asked my dad about his grandfather, and it had turned out that he had never met his grandfather because when my great grandpa, um, because when uh, my father's older brother was born, my great grandpa thought that it would behoove him to hop on the first freight train out of Tucumcari, New Mexico, headed back to St. Joseph, Missouri to see his only grandson, which is what he attempted to do. He grabbed hold of the train, lost his grip, ended up on the tracks, and that was it for my great grandfather. So my great-grandpa was a hobo, apparently not a very good one. <laughs> but he was a hobo, and his son took after his dad. So my grandpa, when he was a teenager, would ride the rails with his pint of whiskey tucked in his pocket and leave grandma to fend for herself. And she did, too. My aunt was fathered by grandpa's brother. Then on mom's side of the family, religious conviction goes way back. In the late 1600s, great-grandpa, to the nth degree, he was run out of Europe for his preaching. His grandson was a conscientious objector in the Revolutionary War, and today my cousins, they keep the faith by living simply, riding in buggies, and staying out the way of progress. <laughs> so all I inherited from my family was this bad set of Scottish genes and a streak of Amish conviction to do battle with it. But that's not exactly true because there is this streak of solitude. And in those moments of silence, the sermons and the slamming beers, they all make sense. In China, I would revere this as the ancestors speaking through me. The ancestors, the honorable and the debating, each imparting the wisdom they had found desperate for me to express it and in so doing to honor them. But this ain't China, and listening to dead people speak through your blood will get you certified crazy locked away if you talk about it. So fourth the fifth generation, my brothers and I, we cling to our Euro-Afro-Asian roots as if it was us that stepped from the boat. We fly the flag of ethnic pride, forgetting that now we are North American. And not hearing what the ancestors in our blood have to say, it is symbolically we embrace the heritage we are creating, writing our history in sound bites and in headlines and hoping praying to be heard in our children's blood. Well, as it turns out, I have a daughter who's now 21 years old, and as soon as she graduated from high school, she decided that the appropriate course of action was to start hopping freight trains. <laughs> I, I said, Ruby, but a little bit of college credit? But she'd grown up listening to that poem, and she said, come on, Dad, I'm just carrying on a family tradition here. So that's just a warning for you poets. You know, little ones, they pay attention. 
And, uh, but uh, she is still out there hopping freight trains and playing the banjo. So there's a whole other generation that's uh, reviving it. This next poem was written by a fellow I met at the Poetry Slams, a guy named Koi King. I think last I heard, he was somewhere down in the Athens, Georgia area, but like a lot of poets, he gets around. It's a poem called Hooked. It is the worst ever, side-armed and knuckleball through the pearly gates beneath the softest of feathers. It has infiltrated the cracks and seams of the streets of gold. It has passed from soul to soul and angelic eyelocks in the subtle brushing of robes in heavens, markets, cafes, and libraries. The angels are absolutely hooked. It is wet. It is salty. It is clear. It is tears. The angels are hooked on tears. They are crying for eternity, uninhibitedly sad. The angels have been around forever, and they have never felt like this. They grew bored. They grew soft. They grew listless. And now, pain is selling like crack as they drink its newness in dizzying gulps. They are strung out and fighting each other to satisfy their fix. They are creating more. It is, of course, a contraband trade, this selling of tears behind the Heavenly Father's back. But it seems to go like this. There was once a woman, a new mother, who lay dying with her child in her arms. She pleaded with God to let her stay with her baby. But he responded by letting her die. Enraged, destroyed, she was flown to heaven weeping and soon lost her sense of pain. Her cuffs, though, were wet with tears, and once inside, their scent hung ominously in the air of the holy kingdom. Somehow, she remembered and wept in the arms of Gabriel, and the tears were passed on, a disease never so infectious and virulent. And heaven hasn't been the same ever since. There are bars in heaven now. There are weapons in heaven now. There are cops in heaven now. There are suit and sludge and trash in heaven now. And now, for the first time, they got punk rock in heaven now. They got hip hop in heaven now. They got jazz in heaven now. But most importantly, they've got the blues in heaven now. You've got to have a job to live in heaven now, washing dishes, waiting tables, all to pay the rent in heaven now. You've got to eat in heaven now. At night, the angels roll smokes. They dangle their feet from clouds. They're precious, young and sexy. They got tattoos, heartbreaks, and college credit. And they got eternity, and they are hooked. So that was written by Koi King. As Cheryl mentioned, my latest book is a book called Feral Voices that does explore some non-human um, aspects of things. A few years ago, as I was working on it, I was invited to perform in Toronto, uh, Canada at an event called a Furry Folk Festival that was about raising funds for the uh, SPCA. And I realized I didn't have any furry animal poems, so I went about trying to write one. And I didn't quite succeed, but I came up with this. It's, it's the worm. <laughs> Hiding in the sludge, we make our ways through tunnels unseen to visions unseen by human eyes. Moving earth through our bodies, we swim through the soil, making currents around the stones, excreting to nourish roots that break the topsoil, bringing us communion with the sky. It is this simple thing we do that matters to the trees, that breathe life to a suffocating orb of rock and ozone whose seismic gyrations erupt, flipping the script on mammals whose brains delude them to the fantasy of importance. We do not brag nor aggrandize. We will never boast. We eat earth, let our egos grow into separate beings, dividing when they get big enough to have their own opinion. This is how we breed, blessing and releasing ourselves. When the going gets extreme, we begin again to feed the trees in the slow exhale of being alive. For we know that to be free is to be a tree, pushing roots deeply into the soil, pulling in nourishment and life. To be free is to be a tree, to reach for the heavens and find them new life through the cycles and seasons of changes and yet to be constant with purpose to grow and become what you are. To be free is to be a tree.
And for a while back in the, uh, oh, back around 2006, seven, my, uh, my wife Shannon ran a project called, well, she's still running one called Touchable Stories. That's a combination of multimedia art, community oral history, and activism. And she decided to take on a neighborhood, well, take on the, the city of Richmond, California, out by uh, in the East Bay. And she moved out there. So I got to commute from Boston to the Bay Area, back and forth. I was bi-coastal for a time. And I'd have to tell people around here, I was going to Richmond, and no, Richmond is in California. It's a lot like Oakland, but without any of the glamour. <laughs> and that's exactly as accurate as you can get it. Uh, among other things, Richmond was noted for having one of the highest homicide rates in the state of California, and that, that's going some. And while we were out there, there was a homicide that uh, occurred that was shocking even by their standards. It happened at a funeral, and it was enough to send some of the formerly incarcerated OGs, old gangster guys out there just over the edge, and they said it was enough. They had to do something. and didn't know what to do, but one of the fellows grabbed a tent and just went down to a parking lot by where a lot of the trouble went down, set up the tent, and just started camping out and talking to the well-armed young men that were roaming around, just saying, hey, we love you. What is it going to take for you to keep your weapon in your pocket? He and a couple of buddies just did that. They thought they'd make this gesture for maybe a night or two. But while they started it across town, another few tents went up, and a few more people from that neighborhood started hanging out, talking to those well-armed young men. We love you. What's it going to take for you to keep your weapon in your pocket? And then across town, another and another. And pretty soon, there were four little pods of tents, all camping out, all spreading that same message. They ended up staying out for 40 days. In those 40 days, the homicide rate in the city of Richmond, California, went to zero. And it became a thing called the Tent City Peace Movement. And we were really honored to uh, have been invited to take part in trying to help that go on. So that helped give a, a resonance to this poem. Look deep into your heart. Look deeper then into your soul. Search the very bedrock. Ask yourself but one question. Look deep into your heart, look deeper then into your soul. Ask yourself but one question and know that it's been answered. Know again that this profound knowing guides your step as you stand in the whirring buzzing of morass and contradiction that we all live each moment of our lives in. Trust what you do not have words for as you face your fears one by one, calling them into the light, meeting them feet apart, arms by your side, palms open, stand as they glare at you and throw their punch. Allow the blow to remind you that they too are real. That not making a fist, forgive your fears, leave them free to find their own path on the planet. It is this way with peace, both inner and outer. You retain your fragile control in a world that is out of your control. You face your foe with open arms. When need be, absorb the blow and wish a place in heaven to wait patiently for your adversary as they enjoy a long and fruitful life. Refuse to name an enemy. Let your grudges walk away with your fears. It is this way with peace. It can only be done completely. Thank you. And five. Oh, good. Well, I've got two more then. Um, this one's a title to my first uh, book, and it's... Um, uh, kind of stays on this theme. It starts off with uh, another uh, quote, probably one of the, the most enduring pieces of political thought that I've heard. It is from numberless, diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a person takes a stand for an ideal, or acts to improve the lots of others, or strikes out against injustice, that person sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. That was first spoken by Robert Kennedy at the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 1966. Gently, like water, cracking stone, the droplet finds the granite's fault, changes the face of the mountain with persistence and patience. Man. That joke just ain't funny. The locker room was silent. 
as he shut the door behind him, gently, like water cracking stone. Thanks. You've been a great audience, and I truly appreciate it. And also, thanks, Cheryl, for um, inviting me back out. This last piece is uh, another one from the Feral Voices. Um, those of you who know me won't be surprised when you hear me admit that I personally have been known to drag the wee hours of last night into the wee, wee hours of this morning. And sometime around the crack of noon, I found myself wondering just what happened last night and what was my part in it. Being a poet, I've discovered that putting the pencil to the paper is a great way to access that information, and it has led me to the realization that I have personally been on a number of interspecies journeys. So this piece was written one afternoon after I had been a dolphin. My world surrounds me. It's a symphony of buoyancy. Surviving here is always a dance. Sliding, spinning, agile. Nuanced song, shrill and rich, enfold us all. With us in each of the seven directions we travel continuously. North and south, east and west, above, below, and inward, where we always live. Up and inward, out and inward. We always travel in two directions at once. Usually, we move in three. It is in this way we find our food, and in this way find our reason for living. Sensing our place in the one song of the sea, we find our note and feed. Our song grows. This is a way of things here below and above, though we fear for our family that opted for legs and air. Substance is thin there, directions harder to follow. When we break the ceiling for oxygen and sky, we grow more and more distressed. The song sounds pain. The song sounds hungry. It resonates pride, greed, dominance, disharmony. We breathe once because it is necessary, dive deeper because it is essential. Anger is not in our nature. Truth, for more than its moment, is not celebrated. Justice, the province of the divine. We dive inward, deeper, to find rectification, atonement, redemption. We sing from our soul with all our strength. We sing to reach you in the rhythms of nature. We sing to reach you in the stirrings of dreams. We sing to reach you. So join with us, your very being. Sing the song of your soul. Unite the voices above and below. Sing. Thank you. Sus 
Beatle. Remember when we saw them shoot Victor's hands off from his wrist so that never again would he play his guitar to his people time to tickle the wings of the butterflies who were dancing above his head. Angel, sálvame, deme aliento, suspiro. Peach and pear.